We begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which Yarra Theological Union lands, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, for they hold the memories and traditions 
of the sacred ceremonies, rituals, and initiations that were performed to him. Let us listen to the wisdom of this land, breathe the air, be open to the spark of light, deep in her spirit, guiding us as kin. May we walk humbly with the spirit of the Wurundjeri people in this place where the word of God finds a home. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Rosie. Now may I invite our speakers and our chair to take your seats. Please. It is my honor today to introduce our speakers for this seminar. Our principal speaker is our provincial, provincial of the Divine Word Missionaries, Australia Province. He has um, many hats that he's wearing nowadays. Um, one of them is uh, being a member of the YTU Senate and Council. He is also a member of the Plenary Council. He represented the Arante peoples of Central Australia at the 2006 United Nations Indigenous Forum. He presented a paper titled Aboriginal Women and Children in a Landscape of Risk, exploring the deep wound evident in ongoing devastating statistics relating to the First Nation people across a range of life factors. The principal speaker, welcome Father Asaili Rats SVD. Thank you. Good Our respondent is a presentation sister. She has spent almost 30 years of her life caring for people who are chronically homeless, incarcerated, or suffering from addiction. With her group of volunteers in Sydney, she helped build Kena communities on the model of creating communities that values creation and care for people with limited options. Welcome, Sister Anne Jordan, PBVM. Thank you for me. And our chair for this seminar is, the currently, is currently the parish priest of Our Lady of the Sacred Heart Parish. Alice Springs. <laughs> he has been ministering in Central Australia for the last eight years. In his capacity as the Episcopal Vicar for the Southern Region of the Diocese of Darwin, he was the delegate for the Fifth Plenary Council of the Catholic Church in Australia. He says, quote, Plenary Council was an opportunity primarily to listen to what the Spirit is saying to us here and now. Secondly, to speak and raise our voices concerning the various issues of love, as well as the good works in the ministries of our church. Thirdly, to come together, both virtually and face to face, to realize that we are one in the presence of God and one in working for God's mission entrusted to God's church on this earth. Our chair for the seminar is Father Prakash Manassas. Go up. That's okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, Good afternoon. pleasure to be with you here from Central Australia, which is called the Heart of Australia. Good place to be and it's a privileged place to be to work with the First Nation people, the Aranda people of Australia. And I bring the greeting to you to the work of Aranda land and thank you extraordinary for welcoming us to this country. As the, our um, speaker and also the respondent have been already introduced, I think I'll not delay too much uh, and speak too many things. So going straight, I think, to further ask to begin you know, with that wonderful presentation uh, of the theme of the day. Thank you. Thank 
I'm going to time myself. <laughs> so, good afternoon, and uh, thank you all for being here today to celebrate uh, SVD Mission Day since 1985, and also celebrating 50 years of uh, Yara Theological Union scholarship mission and uh, service. Warm welcome also to those who are participating online today. I'm going to let you work, and it's going to be fun. First up, a question for reflection. Can you speculate why the Catholic Church has not identified itself as a, a peace church? Do you think that is changing? I'm going to uh, tell a story, a true story, to begin this exploration. Immediately after Easter 2022, I found myself on Bathurst Island, Diocese of Down, Northern Territory. Here, the elf told me a true and tragic story. On the 11th of April 2006, a young man by the name of Gordon had a girlfriend. According to the family, this 24 year old had been arguing with her girlfriend since they got back together. He was jealous. She didn't care. But no one expected Gordon to die that day. April 11th was a Saturday night, and the evening began at 4 p.m. with three hours at the town's only social club. There's only one social club on the island of Bathurst. Afterwards, Gordon and his girlfriend took home a crate of Cascade beer. Then an improvised bong sparked up in a bucket and Gordon and his friends smoked until they entered a parallel world. Within an hour and a half, according to his cousin Michael, Gordon was off his head and was raging. So he ran to the nearest electricity pole and began climbing up towards the 11,000 volt cables. A crowd of children playing footy and rugby on the ground gathered to watch the awful spectacle. For 10 minutes, Gordon swayed and swore, babbling about how awful his community was uh, and how he was haunted by a devil and jealousy of all sorts. Then uh, he dived off. Slamming into the ground, the skull splitting like uh, watermelon. As I said, this event took place in 2006. If you don't know where Tiwi Islands are, that's on the map there, north of Darwin. Now, the day I arrived, post-Easter of this year, the community actually was yet again burying another young man who died exactly the same way as Gordon. So seven years later, in the past 10 years, if you don't know, this tiny community north of Darwin, 20-minute flight from the casino and the malls of Darwin, had acquired the highest rate of suicide in the world per capita. Myself, I have buried close to 50, five zero, yes, 
suicide-related deaths in Alice Springs, where Prakash is working. So, an elder commented, when all you have is violence leading to death, and the funeral ceremony is the only thing that remains of thousands of years of culture, what else is there for the future of our grandchildren? Just before I left Bathurst Island, I was approached by the only remaining custodian of the island, knowing that we, Divine World Missionaries, are going to work with them, in fact, we are already there, and to build on the legacies of the missionaries of the Sacred Heart, who have been there for more than 100 years. He sat me down and said, Father Ras, it's grief after grief on this island. Whatever you're going to plan, Whatever your order is thinking of, make healing your priority. I would never forget his words. Make healing your priority. This is your template. Question for your own personal reflection. If you live in a culture of overkill, how can we be surprised that there is violence in it? I'd like to touch on the macro level. And I'm going, not going to bore you with all the details of global human suffering. But there is no doubt, and I'm sure you'd agree with me, that the problem of violence, the problem of human suffering, is becoming the main question of global mission today, whether we like it or not. It's in your face. Turn on the television, the radios, it's right there. From the war raging between Ukraine and Russia, the impending a nuclear um, war that is coming up, we hope not, to the growing insecurity in Nigeria, then the devastating effects of climate change on the vulnerable environment, to the violent deadlock which has left millions of people in Myanmar in need. And we know this because our mission is really struggling there in Myanmar. How about the gun culture in the United States of America? We heard years ago about the ethnic cleansing in Africa, in the Balkans, where, according to historians, more than 250,000 were killed. Yesterday, watching CNN, they reported that the homicide rate for the United States rose 30%. 30% between 2019 to 2020. And they were able to isolate the incident. It started from the Black Lives Matter movement. That's about 9,000 deaths in the United States last year alone from homicide. This week, a friend of mine called me as we were discussing about uh, Russia and Ukraine. And he said to me, forget it, Russ. The challenge of containing violence abroad is now exceeded by the challenge of making peace actually right here in Australia. In our homes, our streets and neighborhoods. Perhaps what Thomas Merton predicted 25 years ago has come true. In his book, Thomas Merton on Peace,
question for reflection. If you disagreed with President Putin resorting to military action against Ukraine, how far would you go and what means you would use to oppose it? Okay, we know, I know, this is a daunting task. And therefore, prioritizing mission in a wounded world is not for the faint-hearted. Mind you, I did think of another proposition for, as in mission for the wounded world, but I decided to drop it because it implies impatience and a bit of arrogance. And also the fact that missionaries of the past, how they mingled with colonialists. So let's stick to God's mission in a wounded world. I think it's, it's better. So the deep trauma of the multifaceted wounds of the 20th century needs strong spiritual imagination. We need spirit, spiritual people to start thinking creatively. A robust missiological discernment for the missiologists out there. How shall we attend to God's mission in this wounded world? creative discipleship, and of course, a strong dose of non-violent prescription or resistance. And of course, you know, 45 minutes today does no justice to the subject at hand. It's too much. And we must also acknowledge the limits of any follower of Christ to respond effectively to the ongoing violence today. It's overwhelming. So in tackling this subject, I am also confronted by the sheer volume, the sheer volume of woundedness in our world today and the complexity of the interplay of violence, whether it's spiritual or cultural or social, etc. I also know I am risking oversimplifying the challenge facing God's mission today and risking offering a kind of a band-aid to deep life-threatening wounds in our world. So I may sound naive, but anyway, I may also sound pessimistic, <laughs> but I'm looking at the wounds of the world. To a world that's still graced by God, eh? the world where God saw it to be very good from the beginning in the book of Genesis. So hang on in there. Still, I strongly believe discerning God's mission in this wounded world or wounding world is a call from the deep, a call from the Holy Spirit, huh? the missionary par excellence to do something about the violence around us. And whether it's possible to eliminate the root causes towards healing, social justice, and peace. Violence is now spreading like a virus. So I'd like to advocate a triad of what we call missional attitudes to explore further what we're discussing today. Firstly, a culturally sensitive approach to tackling violence. Secondly, working together inter-religious cooperation and solidarity. And if it all fails, faithfulness or fidelity. But before we move on to exploring these, let's backtrack to a bit of history and something that has been in my mind lately. 
unresolved issues of the past. Christian missionaries travel to my part of the world. Okay? And my part of, of the world is called Oceania, North, South, Central, Pacific. In the late 1700s, with the deliberate intention of changing our society. Today, I'm still grateful for those missionaries who came to proclaim God's word. However, missionaries from France and England and Ireland also landed on our shores together with some strangers, European settlers, European traders, who also arrived on our shores to steal our sandalwood, pearl shells, beach dimmer, and deep ocean seals. Obviously, my ancestors could not tell the difference between who was who. <laughs> Missionaries and traders like, hey, how come you arrived on the same boat? <coughs> and so was this former prime minister of Kenya, Jomo Kenyatta. When the missionaries arrived, the Africans had the land and the missionaries had the Bible. They taught us how to pray with our eyes closed. When we opened them, they had the land and we had the Bible. It's what we call the complicity of Christian missionaries, okay? We need to dig deeper into the complicity of Christian missionaries in perpetuating violence on culture, on language, and the deep religiosity of indigenous peoples of the world. And there are a lot of materials and a lot of books that have been written about the role of missionaries in the colonization of Africa and Latin America and the South Seas. What missiologists tend to say, mission in the age of the empire was absolutely problematic. And oftentimes blinded by what? Power, position, protection, and plenitude. In many cases, Christian conversion looked more like European capitalist conversion and the plunder of our natural resources. The Vietnamese American theologian Peter C. Pan observed in his book that the word mission is not an innocent word anymore. It can carry a negative connotation of violence and colonialism. Should we look for another word? I don't know. Then we have the complicity of colonialists and multinational traders. Some serious unresolved issues of the past. They have extracted valuable resources from the global south. <laughs> From across the Pacific and other parts of the globe, they have made companies billions and billions of dollars and comes at a catastrophic cost on the local food source and livelihood. It is happening as we speak. I don't know if you follow the movement of climate change and low data C, but this is one of the scariest things I've ever read recently. In a few months' time, or maybe early next year or the year after, the biggest seabed mining will begin in the South Pacific by a Canadian company called the Metals Company, otherwise Deep Green Metals Incorporated. It has been given a license by the International Seabed Mining Authority, giving this company exploration rights 
of close to 73,000 square kilometers to mine the seabed floor, okay? From the coast of Mexico to Hawaii and beyond into uh, our little islands. To mine for what? What do you reckon? Cobalt, copper, nickel, and manganese. What are these materials for, anyone? Aha. Uh -huh. Your next smart mobile phone. <laughs> and for those of you who are thinking of driving electric cars, there you go. Imagine, imagine eh, when they begin. And what has come to surface that three Pacific Island nations, including the Republic of Kribas, the Republic of Nauru, and the Kingdom of Tonga, they have gone into partnership with a metals company. Why? Well, <laughs> to do with the promises of what? Money. <laughs> Royalties from further production of what is happening on the ground, on the sea, seabed floor. Seriously, you go figure at the potential violence on the interrelatedness of these species. There will be no more. Do you reckon these companies worry about interrelatedness of God's species? Beautiful colored coral reefs? There will be no more. Because of the need to have better, smarter mobile phones. William Smith, a Presbyterian minister, worked in Oxford uh, post Vatican II. The wounds that we, Christians of the West, have inflicted on the world in the last 150 years have got to be recognized. Any conference of missions such as this that don't start with penitence and real sensitivity to the hurt that we have inflicted and continue to inflict, like the metals company, is just not Christian. For the percussion, I and perhaps a few people here attended or were part of the recent plenary council for the Catholic Church in Australia. So, at the end of the day, we adopted a call for the church in Australia to be humble, healing, and merciful. It is a call to be like Jesus Christ, the humble man from Galilee, the gentle healer who touched the wounded, and the one who reveals the mercy of God the to the world. Words from the Plenary Council, not mine. Carefully crafted or crafted. So, from the first assembly last year, and I quote, the distress caused by the church through the failings of some members manifests itself as proud, arrogant, damaging, hierarchical, and irrelevant. It's far-reaching and antithetical to its true identity. And guess what? This pain has many faces, and they are, as identified by the Plenary Council, the sexually abused, the Aboriginal Australian, the homosexual, the divorcee, the drought-ravaged creation, the displaced refugees, and the many more who experience violence alienation, dispossession, and suffering. We also know that there are new and other forms of 
violence still exists today. Let me name them. It's good to name them so we can confront them, such as clericalism, racism, power-hungry priests and bishops, gender violence, and downplaying the dignity of women and the baptismal priesthood of all believers. That continue to create violence, isn't it? Whether consciously or unconsciously. And so to contemplate these faces and sit in the uncomfortable place of our pain, it is challenging. On a Friday afternoon, it is burdensome. I don't know how you're feeling about all this input. <laughs> but it can also be a place of privilege and blessing. For suffering, death and resurrection, the paschal mystery of our Lord, allow us <laughs> to confront the horror and the trauma, the loss and grief. With what? With the promise of resurrection, of new life, of redemption, of hope. Hence, in the words of C.S. Lewis, we can ignore even pleasure, but pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures and speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. So, I don't know about you, Father Prakash, but whatever people are saying about the would-be decrease, I think the Universal Church has to approve what we discussed at the Plenary Council and the bishops of Australia included. For me, it was an opportunity for the spirit to rouse the church in Australia to a new awakening of its ever urgent miss mission to witness Jesus Christ in a violent and hurting Australia. And for that, I thank God for the former PM, PM of Australia, Miss Julia Gillard for starting the process for the Royal Commission into Institutional Child Sex Abuse. Question for you. How would you respond to the assertion that violence is a part and parcel of the human condition and that we are indeed stuck with it? Are, are you stuck with it? Is that a, an excuse to do nothing because it's part of the human condition? We, the Divine Word missionaries, will be holding our 19th general chapter in 2024 in Rome. And after massive consultation around the world, SVD world, the General Aid has come up with a theme, your light must shine. Your light, your spark, must shine before others. Faithful and creative disciples in a wounded world. In other words, we've been tasked, all the SVDs here and people are listening, to prioritize the wounded world, a wounding world, as a context for our missionary enterprise. There is no running away. In fact, I don't know what you think about this, our long uh, Christian view that violence is inevitable and as a consequence of human sinfulness, well, perhaps does not hold water anymore. Because we keep making the same excuse. It's because we're humans, so we are going to bomb you. 
because many people today are saying that it's simply a failure for the human imagination. As Martin Luther King Jr. and Mahatma Gandhi, great apostles of nonviolent resistance, they know what it is all about. At the end of the day, I don't know how you feel about the word violence. According to St. John Paul II, and I'm sure we would all agree, violence is un acceptable. All forms of violence are unacceptable. It destroys the life, the dignity of the human being, and the freedom of all peoples. So the recommendation for a culturally sensitive approach to addressing violence and to respecting the human, the basic human dignity. In 1948, the international community endorsed basic human rights for all peoples and cultures of the world. So despite the diverse cultures and circumstances, the United Nations member states agreed on the fundamental dignity and equality of all human beings. The domain of culture has also emerged as a potent area of discussion and the subject of many interfaith declarations. For instance, I was involved for 10 years in a capacity building project in Alice Springs, and it's to do with violence prevention programs arising from alcohol slash drugs misuse. So together with the Aboriginal elders, especially north of Alice Springs, we would find a spot in the desert to take the perpetrators of the crime out right in the desert, away from town. And that place will be allocated for this intensive, culturally based problem solving program. Young people are then taught ancient skills of tracking, hunting, and survival in the desert. We would also work with the local policemen not to drag them to jail, but to incorporate other activities that highlight major events of oppression of Aboriginal people. For example, police brutality, death in custody, stolen generation, and Black Lives Matter. The simple idea is this, not to humiliate, humiliate the perpetrator, not to humiliate, humiliate anyone, but to care for them and integrate them back into their villages and society. Otherwise, 99% of males would end up where? In jail, castrated in jail. It's not by winning over him, but by winning him over. seen this person before. When Pope Francis, soon after his election, said, I see the church as a field hospital after battle, he perhaps unconsciously moved beyond the traditional Catholic corporal works of mercy to acknowledging the violence we have caused to the many faces of Christ in cultures of the world. The problem is this, the church's Pharisee problem. One often sees, in other words, too much policing and not enough pastoring too much defending the faith and not enough open-handed sharing of the faith, too much protecting borders and not too much crossing boundaries.
again Kofi Annan. People of different religions and cultures live side by side in almost every part of the world. And most of us have overlapping identities which unite us with every different groups. We can in our tradition, even as we learn from others, and come to respect their teachings. Friends, I have no single th thread of doubt in my mind that the global challenge of responding to this pandemic of violence and even COVID-19 calls all of us to increased ecumenical and interfaith awareness and cooperation. I say there is no other way. We Catholics cannot do this alone. Christians cannot do this alone. It's either we rise together in solidarity or fall together in shame for fear of trying. This weekend, my country, Fiji, is celebrating its Independence Day from, Gre uh, I don't want to say Great Britain, from Britain. <laughs> Perhaps all countries, if you celebrate your independence, how about you also celebrate or maybe come to some form of a declaration of interdependence. Our nationalism sometimes blinds us to the legitimate needs of the world. For instance, our interdependence could bring us to address the plight of a billion poor people in the world that live below the World Bank poverty line of $1.90 US. It's dialogue in action. Question. If you have school-aged children in your family or home, are they currently learning conflict resolution skills? How are you going about that? Or do you just allow them to do whatever they like when they get angry? I'd like to bring in the parable of the Good Samaritan because it helps us to reflect on the question, whom are we called to love and care for? And offers guidance about the complexities implied in the term service and solidarity. So the story is an invitation to reflect on the need to transcend boundaries in one service to and solidarity with the victims of violence. It is also a call to overcome the negative assumptions we may hold of those who are different from us and to recognize with humility and gratitude that the other, the Samaritan in this case, may show us the true meaning of service and solidarity. So, this parable asks the question, who is wounded? And whom have we wounded or neglected on the side of the road? And where might we be surprised by seeing Christ-like compassion in action? And it's happening. There's loads of good news that we need to rejoice for people who are helping, people on the side of the road. Finally, faithfulness. Question for you. How do you stay faithful when things get worse at the ongoing violence across the globe, especially the impending use of nuclear weapons? How do you maintain your sanity, your faith, your hope, Mother Teresa, be faithful in small things because it is in them that your strength lies. God hasn't called me to be successful. He's called me to be faithful. I'd like to bring another character from the Bible. Joseph, the book of Genesis, chapter 37 to 41. And this is important for us. 
as I slowly finish off. It tells the low and high points of Joseph's Egyptian slavery and imprisonment. He spent at least 12 years there before he suddenly became the Prime Minister of Egypt. And during that terrible, lonely, desolate time, things seemed to go from bad to worse, from violence perpetrated on him, from being betrayed by his brothers, separated from his father Jacob, thrown into a pit with snakes and lions, sent to a caravan of Ishmaelites and became an endangered laborer, only to be further betrayed by the wife of the servant <coughs> and thrown into prison again. Joseph dreaded the night in his foul Egyptian hellhole. Darkness had swallowed the light from Joseph's life. It was hard to fight off the relentless hopelessness as he waited the escape of sleep. Day after monotonous day, he passed with no sign of change. The familiar desperation surged hot in his chest. His youth was sipping out the cracks of his cage. He was pacing in his soul. Joseph wanted to scream. And then he remembered. He remembered. It was the remembering that kept his hope alive and bitterness at bay. He rehearsed the stories that God had filled him with awe as a child. And according to Joseph's reflection, God was always faithful to his word and eventually delivered his father Jacob and thought brought him back to the promised land, a wealthy man. And so he whispered, like my forefathers, I will wait for you. I have no idea what my being in an Egyptian prison has to do with your purposes, but I will keep honoring you here where you have placed me. Bring your word to pass as it seems best to you. I am yours. Use me. It should not surprise us that Joseph never thought of payback against his brothers. Retaliation, revenge against his brothers. He was a true practitioner of non-violent resistance. Whatever awaits us in our participation in our wounded world, however dismal or successful, they are not our story's end. They are chapters in a much larger story, like in the story of Joseph that really does have a happily ever after. All shall be well. Hope and not anger must direct our actions and reminding ourselves of Psalm 58. Surely the righteous still are rewarded. Surely there is a God who judges the earth. In conclusion, as people of mission, we can neither close our eyes to the reality of violence, nor should we despair or give up hope. We can still believe in the power and promise of shalom offered by the wounded Savior on the cross and on Easter Sunday morning. The unique and awesome truth of our world is this, about our, our human history, is that it can be creative or destructive healing or damaging. And this, my dear friends, is the risk of the incarnation, the mystery of the vulnerable God in our midst. And therefore, our shared yearning for peace, for social justice, for healing across all religions, therefore, is part of the united call for transforming hearts that reconciles the broken and the troubled world. I strongly believe we cannot leave this pathological condition to continue to wreak havoc. And we cannot leave the problem alone to the experts, no. Therapists, social workers, judges, the so-called global policemen in the United States of America, activists and church leaders alone 
cannot stem the spread of violence. At the end of the day, the great modern day prophets of social justice and peace, such as Gandhi, Dorothy Day, Thomas Merton, Gustavo Goiterez, Oscar Romero, Jim Wallace, and Richard Rohr, and groups such as the 20 or more thousand members of Pax Christi International, Catholic Peace Fellowship, and many others in our local parishes, would all agree that we must make a vow of love. Love is the fuel for nonviolence, and nonviolence is the closest way, in fact, is the only possible basis for a new world order of justice and peace. Love conquers all. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Father Arts, for that uh, inspiring presentation. Um, the feeling for me personally, first of all, when the talk began, was a bit frightening. Looking at the facts, looking at what is happening, and especially all these new technological advancements of uh, making profits to some people and uh, in the process not caring for God's creation or respecting God's creation. And all of it, it looked really dismal, painful, shallow, and the raw wounds. And sometimes, as Father has mentioned, it looks like we are providing band-aid solutions. We're trying to heal the wounds from top, not from within. And it sounds as if like, what are we doing? But the beautiful words of Psalm 58 at the end, surely the righteous are rewarded. Surely there is a God who judges the earth. That is the hope. And here we are today present, and we all live in that hope. We believe in that hope. And we continue to share that form. Plenary Council that concluded recently is a step towards that hope. Yes, there are challenges, there are pains, there are things which you don't understand, and you try to do something and it fails. But that is not the end. The call to continue to be faithful, worthful, and there is not the death. For Tori, Mr. Anne Tori, to respond to this presentation. Different to the story that my other journalists can see this. I think it's so wanted to have the phone book. We had it on the phone. And then the client said the phone is broken. The dog is really furious with me. And I'm a dog. I know. I don't work with these groups, and I don't have any but I have a heart full of gratitude for the invitation to be here because we've had so many again all the feelings I've had of being on mission together with the SPD when we were at Cambridge. It's, it's something that has been a glory for me in my journey and for many people of came. I'm here because Gloria Buchanan has been co-lead with BDI and um, I think that's the, the end of the call of the invitation. 
Devoted members hanging in the city, we hope people come together from all walks of life to volunteer to share their lives with people who are not at home. Um, I came to UK and that's what it was to and what it's really became when you look at the provision for charity. In um, London, for now, your thoughts have been there with my first long time. This time in 1975, and it became a book like this came in 1990. First, I read Kevin Burnham saying that the change when I took over from Mark, I had a budget of $400 a month to run the house. They couldn't do it for that, but that's all the new we had. It now takes almost a million dollars a year to. Keep doing what people it's going to teach you, and then there are some few places because we didn't manage to get out here to get back from the government when we had all the years. So there are some places now that by and large it's um, a community organization. I want to tell you three stories. This leads me with no experience of these videos of pain. Bill Burke was celebrating the Eucharist at Christmas in Park, 150 people, came for the people out in the rain or whatever, came back to where we had things for the Mass. And there was no um, I don't know what we are reading, so we asked him to bring a game in the Bible. A man who was dressed in army gear and he was worse than wear, which is the Bible. We had never, I had never seen him in the So no one came near this man, but he, he turned up with the Bible and then he decided he could share it. So as the mass progressed, Bill is sitting at the table and this article is his share of something. And he puts his hand on the chain and it keeps moving forward. He builds his hand. <laughs> and the, the chalice of the target of the pieces. So as Bill says, the chalice is there. Just call them with the men coming. And one of the people answer something to this. Which one can, which hand is the one that's in the class? It's an unknown man. In his ordination, in your ordination, there was a significant event that came with him. He still had been living with us for six months before me. But it was very well known and loved by. The people, particularly the people in the house. Don Simon was one of the men in the house too. On that day, he believed he was quit. So he went into the second day and bent him in on the six of Bethlehem back of the room. And he went to pay for the mother to what legitimate being done. And he was stressed. Now, we got him out of that, and you know, people called us and Julie, and we managed to get him. Into the church, but before we get into the end of the speech, I said to start in the end that we went through might be able to manage this. At the way of the hands, John got away. Trent was down there and he joined the priest on the young hands. He was there and looking down in this church of the church room and then the stones. I didn't know if I was that. I had um, as a big woman, I had a party in my own hands over my home. <laughs> and so we had to go mass, there is a big coordination. John had those two, so um, I got my phone so he could wear thongs. That's the second story. And the third is about um, Jim playing Christmas mass. And Kelvin was there. And Bill Burke was digging 
in Preston at the time. On the wage communion, Kelvin rings Bill. So Bill Tim is going by the aircraft. And Kelvin says, say hi to Bill. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a short conversation because Kelvin takes no, doesn't take no for an answer. So there was a short conversation. These three people, an unknown man, John Simon and Kelvin, brought something to our Eucharist that we would not have had if we'd had, if they were not people who couldn't take no for an answer. There were people who knew that Eucharist was important, that they knew they had a place at that time. Each of them lived a life that had extraordinary violence very what happens in those the inclusion means that they will have been Why? I don't believe that they knew that they'd be on the air because there was a long history of the Even though real older men of this man, he was at this table in the school. Because he had felt something that led him to be a woman. I this is the house, or sort of lunch on the community. So I don't think we need to have a lot of But I don't know if we can do that. I don't know if we can do that. We don't know if we can do that. I don't know if we can Inclusion. Yeah. I must say to you that going for me, going to this mall from that experience of Eucharist and moving into the parish life in this mall, especially during COVID time, when we couldn't be there a lot of the time and when we pull this distance from the past, I guess. But what happens in that I do not have the opportunity in my Eucharist. We love these men when they were back at the house. We do not have a particular amount of women in our church. It's still it's a very painful experience being on the other side of that bar. There's lots said about it, and I'm not going to go on that particular tangent because I think we have other things that will enrich our lives at the minute in how we share mission together and how inclusion is one of the aspects. I will say that the SPDs, they came out so much richness. In Germany, we were mission to get out. Bill was there prior to not very Tim Norton came in the 90s, and a lot of men, novices came after him with being Star's director. We've had celebrants from that, so we don't have the current time. My wife was there and ran the house that hosted 10 people every night who would otherwise have been on the streets. The house was full to reason us. I had to close during COVID time, but I was so it's just recently I went to another house to know what to pick up there again. The sharing of resources, I was a blessing in opening up by Jill. And so pay of all ways. And part of the claim well, was just being shared with us, like as if we were SPDs. We had retreats there, we had wakes, we had funerals, we had any number of very special times and weekends. Hill, that same man used to come down, bring Bill at Preston, but he would come a whole day with Bill. 
It was an extraordinary time for him. He had challenges to rebuild. We build it in Rome. Maybe tough it is to be able to get letters from the Pope. I'm not sure which Pope, but she got letters from the Pope. She loved the Pope, well, whichever Pope, didn't matter, but she did have a But she would get letters from the Pope. Never got another one when Bill left Rome, I might say. I don't know whether there's a question in that or not. <laughs> one of the things that the SVD has brought to Canaan was interculturality. As Kana people, we had understood uh, another culture in terms of the culture of people who'd spent life in prison, in um, hospitals with mental health issues, people who were disadvantaged in some way, homeless, whatever. But when the SVDs came, not so much with Tim and Bill and Mike, but with the multiculturalism, and the intentional way that you choose to live in communities that are multicultural. That just came like a, a great wave to us that came to us in different ways. We got sandwiches made with things we would never have put together. We were taught how to eat chili. We were taught a whole lot of things about what it's like to come from a very different way of thinking. And I want to say we got some things right and we got some things very wrong. And I'm sure that there are some SVDs who would feel really quite hurt, would have felt quite hurt at the time about our lack of understanding and our inability to see. And I'm sorry, and I'm really sorry for that experience that those people had. I wasn't done maliciously, I didn't know One of the things about Miguel. Miguel was in Angola, and in terms of his sense of mission, I'm trying my first time to gave him a little bit. I was reminded this at Flags in the dining room. Sent him to Barsa Flags, we could put on the table from the different nationalities, and I gave him 30 dollars, he didn't get there for the players. He came back with a number of little flags on the table, but a very big flag that covered the whole front of the cafe. And he had a little 130 yards. And of course, I don't know if that was in the long hands, but I do. But I was at my best for a little switch heavy recording. And we got my around saying, you know, and the girl said to me, this is what I mean about that was a mission. He would say, and if it's permission, $30 is not too much. And if it's not permission, $30 is too much. And, you know, that wasn't particularly long. It was his ability to have the, the, the experience of no permission. So we had a coming together with the value of interculturality and religious and Pope Francis is very important and we make sure that um, hearing each other is part of the parents of the and you say to them, this is my 
Ross said, I had no fear of her doubt in my mind. The global challenge should be coming to this pandemic of climate. And if we think you need to look at the end of that religious aware and cooperation. Inclusiveness, individuality, and our relation with God. I hope it is. At that level of cooperation, there is no more needs. There will be right to share the needs on the earth. Yeah, I'm going to see it. I'm going to show you for a bit. Energy, the make the efforts, all that we might even be doing the right thing. Whatever the end is. Our relationships are the heart of what we can do. I think the stories that we've heard and the stories that um, are part of the early series. Of all, we need an even more change, even more healing, creatively, and gently down the We will have to be better. We will have to grow, be in the end of the day, that they And I thought to him to come spend the and this day after I'm coming up to the The other day I asked him to see that the thing is that he was to reach the end that didn't happen to him, but he said, I have to come and give him an idea. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and he said, I'm going to and so good. Make praying in your heart. 
Hey, living water cleanse your soul. Because of you, because of you, may I be saved. That you may know within you, within your heart, you really are God's work of art. So when we know the head of the heart, we know the head of the heart. We that life that you talked about once. Let it shine. We are God's work of art. We are God's work of art. We may know that they are hearts. We are the hearts of the Lord. Thank you. Thank you, John, for that uh, wonderful response, I can say, uh, of uh, the stories. Um, of these real people, these are not fictional stories, these are real people who have gone through pain, who have gone through woundedness, who have gone through loss, who have felt neglected, left alone, um, as if there is nobody there and they were able to come to Kenya community and felt their inclusion, their interculturality. And also moving into this, uh, uh, from the stories of uh, with the being Bill and Tim and in this, if you want to call, um, the familiar to unfamiliar grounds of people from other parts of the world bringing in their culture, making these sandwiches of some kind and uh, giving us some different taste and struggling with it, trying to see if we can change, um, if that change good, um, but also failing and accepting that failure and moving on. Thank you so much for bringing it out to us and sharing with us and uh, telling us there is hope. We can restart again and again. We can go back and again. We will fail. We will struggle. Truth hurts. So we need to stand up and we continue to do that. And again, connecting to that band aid solution. Well, you'll give an example of no more band aid solution. Something from within. Healing happens from within. But it takes a long time. But time doesn't matter. Then go and wait. Thank you so much for that. So now we have a lot of time or not. So we have, I think, up to our time really well. We are on the dot. Usually it doesn't happen in Central Australia, but we have been doing Um Now I'm going to go back to RMC. Thank you. Thank you for coming. So now we're invited for coffee and tea. The chips at the back. And for our, our online friends, we will be back in 30 minutes. So see you then for our question and answer session. Thank you. Enjoy the event. Thank you. So welcome back. Thank you again, and I hope you are all well refreshed after that short break. We are starting our question and answer segment. Um, whoever, uh, I will be, I will be going around with the little microphone, and uh, you will just address our speakers, and it will be again moderated by our chair, Prakash. Yes. Uh, welcome back again. Show you how it is. Right. 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 After that, uh, well presented two presentations and the response. Thank you so much uh, to Father Arthur and Mr. Anne. So, floor is open. Do you have questions, thoughts, comments? Um, put your hands up and then over, and then we'll uh, have Rubel going around with the microphone. Now, that microphone is technically for our audience online, uh, otherwise, they wouldn't hear your questions. They might need to raise the voice a little bit louder so we can also hear as well. So just because they've got a microphone in your hand doesn't mean that the voice will come here. Uh, and our uh, questions you can direct uh, individually or as a group, uh, as a, um, if you want to direct them in common, so it's up to you. So 
Floor is open. Open it. <laughs> I'll see if that's that. <laughs> I'd like to address my question to either Prakash or Ras. You both minister, or Anne as well, in a church which has, uh, which actively discriminates against some kinds of people. You can think of the divorced and remarried. Um, you can think of the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, it seems to be very rigid in what it sees as the way forward. So I can address it to any of you because you're ministering. How do you rationalise that in your present positions? because you are all part of the Catholic Church. You are part of the missionary activity of the Church. I find it a challenge to try and reconcile mm. um, authentic tradition, Catholic tradition, and trying to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit through people whom we have continued to marginalize, like the LGBTQI+, mm. plus, divorced and remarried, who are still not allowed to receive the Eucharist. Mm. So it is a tension. Um, I don't have any <laughs> solution to the matter at hand. So I'm, I'm personally struggling uh, with lots of yes, space I came okay. across a lot of these issues. Um, and they come from God's stream. So yeah, it's, 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 it's a tug of war. Um, I've uh, been asked to be part of the ACL to look at the, the issue of contributors. Us because we did address it minimally at the recent plenary council. I was a bit disappointed at the council. We have to submit to pray for that. Not enough. Absolutely not enough. Thank you. I spent many years at the Northern Church. I used to really resent that a person who did not know the people who came would come and celebrate years, which was the heart of our lives. And Attitudes are 
so that I can be inclusive in the country and not be offensive. But I really struggle with Joan Chittister's questions. They do be scared, like with your feet. And I know many women like me who do not regularly go to a parents anymore. We need something different. We need a different type of theology. We need redemptive to transformation theology. We need to move our language and we need to move a whole lot of things that make it really relevant to our lives. So I can't really say how to do more than that other than keep saying this is what we need. Thanks. And uh, summarizing what both uh, Father Raz and Sister Anne talked about is uh, that ongoing uh, effort and not stop talking about it. Because if the moment we stop talking about it, we won't be addressing it. And that's what Father Raz also mentioned, those raw wounds which are there. And if we don't face them, if we don't uh, address them, if we don't talk about them, then we are like, oh, everything is fine. That's where the band-aid comes in. We keep putting the band-aid. That shouldn't be the case. Thank you for that question. Pass it to you. Thank you. Um, I was struck by Ross's use of the example of Jomo Kenyatta saying that they told us to pray with our eyes closed and next we found that they'd taken our land and we were left with the Bible. Um, that because of my past experiences of living under that sort of colonial situation, because I used to live in East Africa as a child until I was 15, and it sort of, it really struck me. But what I hope is that perhaps that with education that these things will change. And as the years go on, it's not happening fast enough, but maybe with more education and more intermingling of people and people who've been in what we used to call the colonies. And there's dreadful things that went on there. There were also some good things that went on and offering of some sort of education as well, but also dreadful things. And it's the same with the Aboriginal people here, that, you know, they thought they'd do a good thing by putting them, out, taking them away from their families and putting them in a, another house to bring them up that way. Well, that's dreadful. But I'm hoping that as the years go on, that perhaps we will become more enlightened. And do you think that that's just wishful thinking or do you think that it might, it's happening? She won many years ago the British government made an apology to the people of Kenya um, for harm done during um, the time of colonization. Uh, and they were compensated. I like the fact that the British built roads and started schools. I, I have to admit that uh, in the South Seas, eh? they did a lot of good, no doubt then. But there are still some unresolved issues. So yeah, I, I think I agree with you. Education of what happened in the past uh, is important. Uh, and not to be afraid to look at it and see where did we go wrong, not just the multinational corporations, but also the church. The mm. hand um, on cultures and language. Mm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, that is also true for our own First Nations people um, and how we are still struggling with one of the contributions that our First Nations people have done recently is the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Yes. Mention <laughs> what it is that we are looking for. As we are also aware that uh, the current government, the Prime Minister has announced that there will be a referendum in 2024 uh, on uh, getting the voice in the Parliament. 
and that is the one which we are now working towards so conscientizing the people about and that is based on the Uluru statement of the heart. The question is how many of us have actually read it? Mm -hmm. Because many of the people have not even read it, don't even know what it is. It is only a one page document mm -hmm. and we have not even made an effort to read it. So if you are not even started from there, who is going to vote in the referendum? Each one of us are. I mean, I'm not a citizen yet. The <laughs> citizens will be voting into it. And if you have not made an effort even to read this document, what it is about and what does it mean, voice in the uh, parliament? Um, so, how are we going to vote? What are we going to vote? Just go and put the yes there for the sake of putting it? Or we are walking with the people? So, these are important questions and thank you for raising them. And these are the small things and they are little things, but they make a big change, a big difference. And again, thanks for the question as well. Uh, in between yes, you are raising questions, we are concluding. Do we have any thanks, thanks. online? I really encourage uh, our uh, audience who are joining us via YouTube link if you could write your questions or comments on the comment section uh, on our uh, YouTube channel there. More questions? Thanks, Prakash. Uh, Peter, yes, if I could preface my question with a comment. We live in the Yarra Valley, and our shire used to have a sign, uh, we live in Mount Evelyn, and it had a sign, a learning town. And the wits used to change the word learning to leaning uh, or yearning. Uh, and finally, the shire took the signs down because, uh, but I, I, the reason I mentioned that sort of little joke and little story is that I suppose we all take different things at times and change them. If we take that we are a wounded world, how do we really come to heal? From your talks today and for your presentations today, you've mentioned a number of factors uh, you know, and things. Where, where is the urgency? What's the thing we put on first to actually start the wounds to heal? Is it redemption, forgiveness, understanding the past and working through that? Is it accepting that, you know, that we are originally blessed people, not originally sinned? What is it, you know? Thank you. Everyone is... We're here because we understand we want to do something for our mission. It's mission day. Which means that we have a passion for mission. You wouldn't be here if you weren't. But to really think in my world, where can I take leadership? Who can I influence to think like I'm thinking, to work with me, to make some change for healing in our little neck of the woods? We can operate at levels that are personal, but it takes our whole body, mind, heart, spirit, and body. You know, we've got to be committed with the whole being, and we need a community committed with the whole being. So I think if that would be, I think, the starting point. It's, it becomes a movement that can't be resisted because it's a groundswell. <clears throat> Just to add on, uh, I was with my nephew uh, last week and um, he got angry and then I watched him kick uh, his sister. The mother was sitting right there and me too, so we watched the whole. So he kicked her and the sister my niece said, I'm not going to retaliate. And then the nephew the, then poured coffee over her. We watched the whole thing. And she kept saying, do whatever you want. I'm not going to hit you back. That was a big learning for me. It you know, begins with your own leadership. Um, especially the movement towards non-violent resistance. Um, it's possible. 
you know, it's possible that we begin with ourselves. <laughs> I mean, we look at the global violence, it's overwhelming. Yes. I'm sure at micro level, I, I can do something <laughs> where I live, you know. Uh, Thanks. And again, I do concur with the, both of you, that the leadership begins with us. Um, one of my uh, appointment with the plenary council is the <laughs> consultation process which happened before, four years ago. The efforts were put in and the information was put in for asking communities to respond, telling what is the Holy Spirit asking us for us here today in Australia, what is God asking us, and that question came out. We got 200,000 responses through that. Enormous, but not enough. Yes, it was great, but I wish they were close to, because we are about some million Catholics in Australia. Five million Catholics. 200,000 is not even 10%. We wanted more. That's where the leadership needs to come in where I need to feel free to express myself. And that's, I think, is a fear. I think many of us are struggling with the fear to tell out. Simple example of a, in a parish, I'm in the parish, and uh, um, somehow the priest has to tell to do some things. As simple as turning on the fans when it is too hot. In our experience, it's hot, and we have got fans. Switches are just there. If it's too hot, you should go and turn on the switches. No, wait for Father to tell you to turn on the switch. I'm like, Take initiative, that's okay. I'm not I'm not going to eat you. you know, there is some fear, there is some kind of and I did mention about there are some evils, there are wounds every day. One of them is clericalism. Are we still clericalist? And those are the questions we asked before. Is this still leading us in doing things? Are we creating that fear in the people that if we do this, you are going to hell or something? I don't know. So we need to address these things and being aware of that, that fear has to go away. Thank you again for that question. No, thanks, Ray. We have time for maybe two more questions. And in the meantime, I keep encouraging the people watching online to comment or uh, ask questions. Thank you. Um, I like very much Father Russ the title and you, you told us your reasons for missionary church in, not for, in a wounded world. That was, that really um, stayed with me because it, it reminds me that we're in solidarity with those to whom we think we might be missioning. Uh, we're we're part of this wounded world along with our companions. Um, and also I liked following Peter's question, where do we start? Um, I like, Russ, what you said about, or what the Tiwi man shared with you, and he said, priority is healing. Uh, so, yes, and I find myself, you know, what a challenge. It's. Russ, you, you shared about the urgency of the, the pains and the stains in our world of violence and our communities and ourselves. Um, but for me, where do I start? Coming back to Prakash sharing about the Uluru Statement, asking us to First, uh, truth telling. Name, name the name where you are, the history or the what's going on, and also for me, where to start is it's in company with the Holy Spirit because it's about lament and waiting and trusting, along with my desire to act and do something. It's also the importance of acknowledging, as the Uluru Statement says, wrong, done, or the, the sad place we're in, and trusting and waiting on God's spirit to uh, inspire me for action. And yeah, so thanks. 
Thank you. It's far in for action in the qualities. Um, we get a lot of inspiration from different things in our life. But part of what we take them and sit with them and don't do anything about it. That we are called to act. And as uh, Jan mentioned about the small things we begin with, and they take on their own uh, their own moment, and the moment begins, that swell begins, and things start to happen. But that is possible only if we, if we take action. And if we don't, we tend to sit away and uh, hide away from it. Um, good thing is, we are talking about it. We have created forums here at the moment. We are able to talk, which is a great thing. So action is beginning in small things. And movement from it is that what needs to happen. And that is the next step. Any other comments we have or questions? Sorry. At the end of the day, there's ongoing violence between Russia and Ukraine. Perhaps the question for us is the Holy Spirit saying to all of us, as followers of Christ. I'm just like a man who be trained. My disillusionment happened about peace marches when we protested against the Iraq war. At that protest, there were people, grandparents, it wasn't the usual peace march. It had people from all walks of life right across our country, and nothing happened as a result of it. I had the same thinking feeling in relation to all the responses that came to the plenary council. I think if you ask for responses today, you'd probably get half as many, because nothing happened out of our responses. And I think how we find hope in our hearts from there is, is back in David Marsh's reminder that I am God's work of art, you are God's work of art. Together we can make our lives shine much more strongly than in our just Thank you. I think with this, we conclude the session for the question and answer. And thank you all online members for uh, joining us in uh, that capacity. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for giving me the opportunity to chair the session. And I hand over the microphone to RMC. Thank you, Prakash. So, um, thank you also, some of the speakers, Russ and Anne. And to all of you. Uh, so now we we call our event organizer, the the brain behind this mission day 2022 for acknowledgement, Albano da Costa. Thanks, Leo. You have done an amazing job. All of us, all of us, done an amazing job. Uh, especially my 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 thing was to my own members in the community, and Mike Knight, the leadership director, Lynn is the formation director, and the member of the university student body. I know all of you, some of you are already in chapel getting things ready for the Eucharist at six o'clock. Uh, but thank you. Look at this, look at this amazing posters that yeah, our network has created. Mm -hmm. 
for a missionary church in a, in a wounded world. That was a beautiful topic that, uh, that came up in our discussion with Ras and the whole point of bringing you and uh, and uh, Prakash and Sister Anne together here was you wanted to hear from your experience of being at the penalty Cups, being the participants at the uh, members delegates in the penalty Cups, and uh, it's been such a wonderful afternoon today. Thank you for raising and giving us the wonderful insights and real stories from real life, real life stories. And as, as you began your presentation, you felt was a daily tender children body of stuff that uh, the experiences from the TV audience. Thank you for the inspiring voice for us uh, this afternoon and Sister Anne, with your experience and uh, thank you for sharing your stories with us, real stories and thank you for uh, instilling us in us in that fire that each of us we are. Thank you Prakash for your presence of the way from Central Australia and uh, also being the parish priest and other acts that you are wearing. Thank you for making this article. And also we feel so proud and Mike and other populations I'm sure you have been student here. The last you have gone through your formative time here in Dorish Modern College and people know and we speak to them about Mission Day. It's almost coming close to 40 years, uh, 40 years of, of that tradition of having that. And it is, it's, it's beautiful for us to come back after two years of COVID break. Thank you for being here, each and every one of the alien units. Thank you. So I don't know about our presentation, Ras, uh, a small card. Thank you, Carl, and what all my and in fact, also well, and let's get ready to have an hour break or before we start the incidents. And uh, yeah, thank you for giving us this one last one. Thank you. Thank you, Arpano. Now we are all invited to proceed uh, next door to the door to uh, St. Pascal Chapel for our Eucharistic um, uh, celebration. And to those who join us online by YouTube, near and far, we see you next year. And on behalf of SVD Australia, this is uh, Roel Bancoro in uh, YTU Study Center. Thank you very much.